What is up, everyone? Today we are going to actually start talking about the different organ systems within our body. So over the next few lectures, we'll be discussing the nervous system. So today I will introduce the nervous system, and then we'll talk about how neurons are actually going to communicate messages. We can divide the nervous system into multiple subcategories. And so if we want to look at it anatomically, the neurons that make up the brain and the spinal cord, these are called the neurons of the central nervous system. The central nervous system is going to help process information about our environment. It's going to help carry out movement. And then we also have neurons which communicate from the brain and the spinal cord to the rest of our bodies. And that's called the peripheral nervous system. And so if we look at the communication between these two nervous systems, we could see that in one branch, we're going to send sensory information, which is picked up by different receptors in our body from the peripheral to the brain and the spinal cord. So these sensory inputs are being carried by afferent neurons from the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system. And so things like the amount of light in the room, things like the amount of stress that's being placed on your, on your muscles and your joints, all this information it, at all times is being sent to the brain to get a sense of our environment. But then actions also need to be carried out within the body. And in order to do that, the central nervous system is going to send motor outputs out to the peripheral organs. And so the Afferent division of our peripheral nervous system can be divided into two sections. One is the somatic nervous system. And this branch of the nervous system carries out all of our movements generated by skeletal muscle tissue. And then we have the autonomic nervous system, which carries out all the actions that you don't need to think about. Things like your heart rate and your digestion. So all of this information is being sent back and forth in between the brain and the peripheral, the rest of the body, in order to carry out homeostasis. So again, there's a lot of information that is being communicated throughout the body. And neurons are responsible for transporting that information from the peripheral to the central nervous system and vice versa. And so sensory neurons are going to be the ones that transport information from the peripheral to the central nervous system. For example, let's say you touched a very hot object. Sensory neurons are going to be the ones that communicate the information from those thermoreceptors, the ones that are picking up on that temperature, to the brain. And then we have interneurons. So interneurons are going to communicate with in the spinal cord and the brain, the central nervous system. And they're going to transport information to different parts of the brain and different parts of the spinal cord in order to process sensory information and then process motor output. And then motor neurons are going to be the ones that send information from the central nervous system to the peripheral nervous system. Here we're able to see a neuron. And so if you want to picture a neuron preceding this neuron, that neuron is going to carry a message through this neuron by releasing what is called neurotransmitters. And so down the right hand corner, you can see at the uh, place called the synaptic bulb, these neurotransmitters are stored in vesicles. And when a action potential reaches the synaptic bulb, these neurotransmitters are going to be released in a place called the synapse. I'm going to talk about action potentials a little bit later on in the video, and especially more in the next video, where I'll break down the steps of an action potential. But basically, neurons are able to communicate via electricity. And when the stimulus is strong enough, an action potential is created, which travels down the axon, and then once it reaches these synaptic end bulbs, neurotransmitters are released and then bind to receptors located on the dendrite of the next neuron. So this electrochemical communication is how neurons are able to relay messages between one another. Here we see another overview of communication between the peripheral and central nervous system. Sensory neurons are going to pick up 
on sensory inputs via receptors, and then that information is sent to the central nervous system. Uh, interneurons are going to communicate within the brain and the spinal cord to deliver messages, and then motor neurons are going to transport information from that central nervous system to different glands or muscles or organs of the body. If we want to see the nervous system in action, let's think about an event that takes place. So let's say it's a painful event, something like stepping on a Lego. So if you stepped on that Lego, you're going to have these noxious receptors in your foot uh, that are going to pick up on this stressful stimuli. And then that information, that pain information gets sent via sensory neurons from the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system. And that information is going to be processed and delivered via interneurons um, up to a section of the brain. And then the brain is going to need to process that information. And then what's going to happen, it's going to deliver a motor output, uh, probably drawing your foot away from that painful stimuli. So it's going to contract uh, those muscles by sending them via motor neurons uh, to those skeletal muscles. And so you can think about multiple events that our body has to constantly regulate, but all this information is coming back and forth between the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. But neurons are not the only types of cells within our nervous system. We have many other types called neuroglia, which help regulate our nervous system. In our central nervous system, the most abundant type of neuroglia is called astrocytes, and they're gonna help maintain the blood-brain barrier. And so the brain and the spinal cord sit in this cerebral spinal fluid, uh, which is separated from the blood. And it's good that we have it uh, because we need to maintain a proper environment for the brain and the spinal cord, being that uh, they're such important parts of our bodies. And so this blood-brain barrier is going to basically help prevent just any ions or objects from freely moving back and forth. And so astrocytes are going to be responsible for maintaining um, extracellular chemical environment and are going to play a role in synapse formation and forming those uh, neuron communication networks that we see throughout the body. In order to maintain that cerebral spinal fluid, we have what's called ependymal cells, which help produce uh, some of that fluid. But this is not where most of the fluid actually comes from. It comes from the choroid plexus located in the lateral ventricle and the fourth ventricle. Then we have what's called microglia, and these are phagocytes of the central nervous system. And these cells are going to be responsible for getting rid of unwanted debris, damaged cells, and different pathogens that could potentially mess up our central nervous system. And then we have what's called oligodendrocytes. And these are going to be really important uh, for the formation of what's called the myelin sheath around neurons. And we'll talk about this in a few slides. But this myelin sheath is going to be very important for transporting messages quickly. In the peripheral nervous system, we have neuroglia called Schwann cells. And these Schwann cells are going to help form the myelination in certain neurons of the peripheral. So just a note, the oligodendrocytes help form the myelin sheath in the central nervous system, and Schwann cells help form the myelin sheath in the peripheral nervous system. What is the point of this myelin sheath? Here we could see a neuron that does contain a myelinated axon, and so this is one in the peripheral nervous system, so a Schwann cell uh, helped form the myelin sheath. And basically, what it's going to do is actually help the conductance of messages along the axon, which means that action potentials are going to be delivered quicker in myelinated neurons than those without the myelination. And so the the speed of conductance we're going to talk a little bit more about later when we get into conducting action potentials. But in these little gaps here in the myelination are nodes of Ravier. And within these nodes of Ravier, there are going to be high concentrations of ion channels. And so this is going to help deliver messages quickly once an action potential is formed. Neurons have certain characteristics, and one of these characteristics is called plasticity. And this is basically the strength of signaling between two neurons, or the strength of the synapse. And that's why a lot of times when we train, when we exercise, not only are we strengthened our muscles and making them grow, but we're also strengthening the communication of these neural networks. And that's why we always say 
practice makes perfect. So the more you can repeat an action, whether it be a jump shot or lifting weights or sprinting, you are training those neural networks and making them more sensitive and communicate quicker in order to get better at that activity. Certain neurons can also repair, and so this regeneration occurs once a neuron is damaged. However, the peripheral nervous system is really where most of this regeneration can occur. And so in order for that to happen, the cell body, which contains the nucleus, which again is able to carry out genetic expression and make proteins, that has to be intact. And then the Schwann cell also has to remain active as well. And so we said earlier, not only does it help form that uh, myelination, but it also is going to help in regeneration of a uh, neuron's axon. Um, and so a Schwann cell can form what's called a regeneration tube, which helps in the regrowth process of that axon. In the central nervous system, little to no regeneration actually occurs. And, the, and this is why when you have damage or an injury to the brain or the spinal cord, that damage can be permanent. And so uh, reasons why this occurs is because of myelin-associated inhibitors and then proteoglycans, which uh, result in the, you know, in the formation of scar tissue after an injury, are all going to blunt the growth response of these neurons. And so they will not be able to repair and then function like they were before that damage occurred. If you think about our nervous system, we have thousands of neurons sending messages back and forth between the brain and the rest of our bodies, and then from the rest of our bodies to our brain and spinal cord. And so what allows for those messages to actually go from one place to the next? What actually allows us to get a sense of our environment around us, the amount of light, the amount of sound, and then what allows us to do things like move or digest food or for our heart to beat? And so it's actually electrical communication of our neurons. And so what we are seeing is that there is electricity being conducted through each of these cells in order to send messages to different parts of our body. But how are these electrical impulses being conducted? Well, in part, it's due to ion channels. And so we discussed ion channels at earlier lectures and so these are going to be important for this actual messaging from one place in the body to the next because with the movement of ions comes the movement of charges and this is how our cells conduct this electricity and so we have different types of excitable tissues we have receptors we have neurons and we have muscle cells and these three types of excitable tissues are actually going to see the movement of ions create this electrical current which is able to carry out messages and you know move our bodies in order to carry out different functions let's talk about the different types of ion channels so first we have leak channels, which are just going to randomly open and randomly close, allowing ions to move from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell, or vice versa. Next we have ligand-gated channels. So if you think about neurotransmitters that are released from one neuron and then bind to another neuron, here's where they're binding, uh, sometimes, on ligand-gated receptors. And certain ligand-gated receptors are ion channels. And so when that neurotransmitter binds to these ligand-gated um, ion channels, it's going to allow this channel to open and then ions to move from the inside and outside of the cell. Mechanically gated channels are going to open and close when some sort of pressure or stretching occurs within that cell. And so, you know, if you think about someone poking you, well, the reason why you're able to feel that is because mechanical uh, gated ions are actually able to open and close based on these different pressures and along with it comes the movement of ions uh, from inside and outside of the cell. Voltage gated channels are going to open and close based on the membrane potential of our cells and these voltage gated channels are going to be very important for the conduction of what's called an action potential throughout a neuron. So you hear me say this term membrane potential, which is basically referring to the charge across the plasma membrane, which is going to be dictated by the amount of ions inside of the cell 
and the amount of ions outside of the cell. We typically will measure this in millivolts, uh, but when we have a cell that isn't stimulated, that's called our resting membrane potential. The ability of a cell to carry out a current is going to be based on the flow of charged particles. And so the amount of ions that are moving back and forth between a membrane, that's going to be the voltage. And the more ions that move, the heavier voltage we get. And anything that opposes that flow, that's going to be called resistance. So here we see a membrane at rest. And on the outside of the cell, typically we are going to have positive charges lined up in the extracellular fluid on the outside of the membrane. And on the inside of the cell, we have negative charges lined up across the plasma membrane. And so that's why most of our cells at rest are negatively charged. The charge of a membrane is going to be dictated by the amount of ions inside and the outside of the cell. And so so what's really going to help determine that charge at a given moment is going to be the amount of channels that are open or closed allowing for those ions to move. Each ion is going to have its own equilibrium potential. And so once that ion has hit equilibrium and there's no net flow of ions coming in or out of the cell, we can use the Nernst equation in order to calculate the charge that is associated with that ion's equilibrium. And that's going to be determined again by the amount or concentration of ion on the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell during that equilibrium. A lot of the membrane potential in, us, in our neurons and in our cells is based on the flow of potassium and sodium. So here we see that potassium, if we allowed it just to move freely and then it reached equilibrium, its equilibrium potential would be negative 90 millivolts. While if we allowed sodium to move freely in and out of the cell, it would have an equilibrium potential of 60 millivolts. The thing is that sodium and potassium are not the only ions inside and outside of the cell. So we have to take into account the permeability of all ions inside and outside the cell, including sodium, potassium, calcium, chloride, and others in order to calculate the membrane potential. So all along the membrane, you are going to see ion channels, including leak channels, voltage gated channels, mechanically gated channels, which allow ions to move freely from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell or inside to outside, basically downhill on their concentration gradient. But a lot of times we're also going to have uh, pumps this one's a famous one called the sodium potassium pump or sodium potassium ATPase, which is going to use energy to transport ions uphill in order to balance membrane potential. When these ion channels open and ions move uh, across the plasma membrane, what's going to happen is that there is going to be a deviation from resting membrane potential, and this is called a graded potential. Now, graded potentials can either be depolarizing which means that we're taking it to a less polarized state, or hyperpolarizing, meaning that we are taking it towards a more polarized state. Here we could see the millivoltage change when a depolarizing or hyperpolarizing stimulus occurs. And so when a depolarizing stimulus occurs, more positive charges are going to enter this neuron. And so that again causes depolarization, and the graded potential can then return back to resting. A hyperpolarizing graded potential, we're going to see positive ions leave the cell, and that's going to cause a more negative, a hyperpolarized state before returning back to the resting membrane potential. And these stimuli are going to cause these graded potentials by the movement of ions. So if we think about all the different ion channels that we have, all different events can basically cause a graded potential. If we think about uh, applied pressure, so someone poking you, you're going to be able to feel that poke because that stimulus generates the opening of these mechanically gated channels and allows ions to move, causing a gated potential. And so all these different events in the movement and the opening and closing of channels are going to allow our excitable cells 
to change their membrane potential. We are going to see that the deviation from resting membrane potential will be greater if the stimulus strength is greater. So whether it be temperature or pressure or whatever the stimulus, the more you apply, the greater the amplitude of the graded potential. If there is an increased frequency of the stimuli, then graded potentials can actually get added together. So you could see if the first stimulus comes about and this cell is depolarizing here, and then before it gets back down to resting, a second stimulus occurs, that deviation is going to be even greater. So this cell is going to depolarize even more because those two graded potentials are going to summate. A graded potential is just any deviation from resting membrane potential. But in order for a neuron to fire its message and in order to release neurotransmitters to the next neuron or for a skeletal muscle fiber to contract, you must reach a membrane potential which is called threshold. So that stimulus or that graded potential in order for that neuron to fire must make the neuron's membrane reach negative 55 millivolts. And remember, typically a neuron's resting membrane potential is around negative 70 millivolts. And so here we see that a sub-threshold stimulus is not going to get us to reach threshold. While a stimulus that makes us reach negative 55 millivolts will make us carry out an action potential with great depolarization and then a repolarization. A super threshold stimulus, even though it may, the graded potential may get us to go past negative 55 millivolts, it really doesn't matter because Neurons have a principle called an all or nothing principle where this action potential is going to look similar as long as we reach negative 55. But what happens is with a super threshold stimulus that typically we're going to get an increased frequency of action potentials in order to translate that this stimulus is stronger. I am actually going to pause this video right here because in the next video, that's where I will actually explain the steps within an action potential and how that action potential actually leads to neurotransmitters being released by a neuron. All right, so please look out for the other videos in this series talking about the nervous system. Thank you guys so much and I'll see you next time.